well done. That's the first change. But in the midst of that change, there may be numerous disappointments, the brokenness, the struggles. When I broke my back in 1985, I didn't realize what changes it was going to bring upon me. I was athletic, I was a sportsman, I loved the sports field, I loved tennis, I loved cricket. All of that had to bid, be bid goodbye in the day when I, when I herniated two or three discs of mine and now had those titanium rods at the back. The writer has put it well, our life contains a thousand springs and dies if one be gone. Strange that a harp of a thousand strings can stay in tune so long. Our life contains a thousand springs and dies if one be gone. Strange that a harp of a thousand strings can stay in tune so long. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's a wonderfulness, wonderfulness to it. There's a fearsomeness to it. That's the first change that I wanted to address. The second is the change of transformation. First is your formation. Then is your transformation that God takes you from mere existence to meaningful existence. He brings you into a new set of hungers, a new set of delights, a new set of wants, and new paradigms by which you measure your life. This is so unique in the Christian life. It almost can take place in a moment, but you know it is spread across time. You ask anybody else of any other worldview, I don't care what worldview it is, what religious worldview it is, it is only this Judeo-Christian worldview that talks about the new birth and the new life. They make fun of it in terms of being born again, but it is not only the greatest mystery, it is the greatest astonishment when you realize you are not exactly who you used to be. The new desires, the new changes, the new longings, the new habits that he puts into your heart. You know, uh, the one that captured this so well, I think one of the greatest books ever written was written by a tinker by the name of John Bunyan. And it is called A Pilgrim's Progress, translated into more languages than any other book outside of the scriptures. And you, if you've not read Pilgrim's Progress, you've picked your own pockets. <laughs> Get a hold of it. Well, I remember going through his home in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom. My wife was with me and there was a lady at the desk and there were people from Japan and Korea and all over the world visiting. And I said to the lady, isn't it amazing? This little book. Think of the millions of tests. Do you know what she said to me? I'm not making this up. I have a witness and my wife standing next to me. She said, I haven't read it. She was the receptionist. I said, you haven't read it. She said, well, I, I'm not into allegories. I said, get the children's version, please. <laughs> Even the children's version is so remarkable, so beautiful. If you haven't read it to your kids, start reading it to them. It tells the whole gospel. And the climactic moment comes <clears throat> when Pilgrim has got this burden on the back and he's coming out to meet the, coming up to the hill and he meets three angels. The first is the angel of dawn. And when the angel of dawn meets pilgrim coming, he just says to them, you know, that uh, thy sins be forgiven thee. And the whole back comes rolling down uh, the hill. And it says how the tears were just pouring down his face. I re really believe Bunyan had read the story with the woman of alabaster ointment to find the terminology for this. Because the tears flowing just like the woman, peace be unto you, just like the Lord said to her, and he was just not willing to leave that moment, the angel of dawn, and then you get the angel of daybreak, the angel of daybreak takes away the old garments, and puts on the new ones, and puts the mark on the forehead, and then there's the angel of dusk, which gives a scroll to give you a map for the journey, what more do you want? I sins be forgiven thee, the new garments that you now wear, and the map to lead you on and guide you into the future. The angel of dawn, the angel of daybreak, and the angel of dusk. He calls them the three shining ones. How beautiful 
an ordinary tinker seeing the beauty of the gospel and he takes you through all of Vanity Fair and all of that stuff and brings you right to that mountain where at the sight of the cross, the bag just falls down. You know, recently when Cliff Barrows passed away, I told the story of a memory with Cliff and his wife, and they lived in Atlanta for some time after his first wife, Billy, had passed away. He married beautiful Ann Barrows, and they made their home in Atlanta, Georgia. We used to meet quite often. Cliff is an amazing, was an amazing man, absolutely an amazing man. He got the world singing, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. But Cliff didn't know that my worldview changes at 9 p.m., so he came to our house for dinner, and about 9.05, the lights started to go out in the house. He was still telling me all of the memories of his years with Billy Graham, what flight they'd missed, what they had in Northeast India, and so on. And as these lights are going off, Anne says to him, Darling, I think we've outstayed our welcome. The lights are going out in this house. So I said, It's okay, Cliff. Your stories are more interesting. I'll turn the lights back on. And then before he left, said, I said, Cliff, I want to tell you one story that you probably don't know. He said, what is it? I said, there was a man who came to meet me when I was speaking for James Kennedy once. He walked up to the front and he shook hands with me. And I said to him, what's your name? He said, uh, I'm, uh, I said, where are you from? He said, Romania. I said, what's your name? He said, Dwight Barrows. I said, Dwight Barrows from Romania? I said, how does a Romanian get a name like Dwight Barrows? He said, it's a long story. He said, you know, during the days of Ceausescu, I wanted to escape. I swam across some waters. I arrived in Vienna, and I stood outside the American embassy day after day, begging them to let me in. I wanted to meet the ambassador. They wouldn't let me do it. So I kept sitting outside the embassy and said, I'm not going to leave, not going to leave till you allow me to meet the ambassador. So he comes into the embassy. Finally, the ambassador says, bring him in. He said, what do you want? He said, I want to move to America. He said, I don't want to go back to Romania. And the ambassador looked at him and he said, you know what? I like you. I'll give you the visa to get to America, but you're going to have to promise me to read two books. He said, which books are those? He gave him the Bible and he gave him the biography of Dwight L. Moody. He said, read these two books. I'll get you into America. And they came here. He said, so I arrived in Detroit. I started working for the automotive company, but I got into alcohol and drugs. I was basically making a mess of my life. Periodically, when I was sober, I would read Barrows's, I would read uh, Claire, Dwight Moody's story and so on and so forth. And he said, one night I was so down, I started to walk way towards the Pontiac Stadium. I said, thousands of people coming out, and I thought it was a football game. I found out it wasn't. It was some kind of religious meeting that was going on. And they were leaving, and it was over. So I walked up to the platform to find out what it really was about, and there was a man there folding chairs. And the man looked at me and said, can I help you? He said, am I late for the meeting? He said, yes, it's over, but come on up, let's talk. And he said, that man led me to lead Jesus Christ. His name was Cliff Barrows. Cliff looked at me and his eyes got so flooded with tears. He said, Ravi, I remember the incident. You got to be kidding me. I said, Cliff, after he came to know the Lord, he got baptized and he took a uh, Dwight L. Moody's first name and your last name, and he was baptized as Dwight Barrows. <laughs> About five or six years ago, Cliff phoned me. He said, do you know how I can get a hold of him? I said, well, you know, why don't you just Google his name? It's not a common name. You know, you'll, you'll find it out. And, uh, he did. He tracked him down. He tracked him down. And Cliff, in his book of memoirs, was going to put the whole story down. You see, when transformation comes, there's always a series of events and a series of people involved. You never do it on your own. God brings somebody into your life. Just before I came here, Pastor's son James came and asked me if I'd sign a copy of that book for a friend who's in the audience tonight, who said he was an atheist, read the book, I don't know whether it was Can Man Live Without God or which one, or one of the programs we'd done, and gave his life to the Lord. He's in the audience here tonight. Amen. 
If you went from story to story to story, you'll find out the power of the transformed life, the power of transformed hungers, how it is that God really brings changes and changes not only what you do, but changes so marvelously what you want to do. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know Christ, as you enter 2017, make this the moment of the year where you invite the Savior to transform your life and give you the new hungers and the new desires. You may be a slave to certain habits. You may be in bondage to certain affections. You may be trapped and you say, Ravi, you don't know my story. I am so bound in chains. And that's what the writer once said, didn't he? The intense is the agony when the eye begins to see, the ear begins to hear, the heart begins to pound, when the soul feels its flesh and when the flesh feels its chains. When the flesh feels its chains and you find there's one who breaks those chains and gives you the new desires and the new birth within your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel message at its core, that the cross of Jesus Christ is provided for your redemption, for your salvation, for your restoration. And it is the glorious message of the Christian gospel alone, nowhere else. You ask a Buddhist, how do you attain nirvana? Stop desiring, stop desiring. Pull yourself up by your own metaphysical bootstraps. You ask the Islam Muslim, how do you attain paradise? His answer will be very simple. Let your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. You ask anybody from the pantheistic worldview, the way you break karma is by allowing your goodness to outweigh your badness. And what it is that Christ does for you and me, he takes his goodness to overcome our unworthiness and gives it to us. And so you have it, bringing you from non-being into being, bringing you from the whole story of uh, your, your transformation of giving you new hungers, giving you new desires, and giving you a marvelous, marvelous new life. You, I, I don't know if you know the story that uh, uh, Dr. Sangster tells us. Dr. Sangster tells us of that this preacher who had come from Leeds towards the north, way down toward the southwest in Plymouth in those days gone by, and he was preaching in that one small town there, and he decided to make a trunk call, as they called it, back home. And the telephone call would weave through its way, through its operators, and ultimately get to its destination point. And while he was waiting, he began to mutter the words of a hymn, where he said, my knowledge of this life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. My knowledge of this life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. One of the operators listening and said, Sir, Sir, will you repeat those words for me, please? And he repeated it. My knowledge of this life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. And he heard her starting to weep and then sob and say, you'll never know, you'll never know what those words mean to me right now when I've needed them the most. And so a preacher making a telephone call from Plymouth to Leeds mutters the words of a hymn not knowing that somebody else is listening in and the transformation that comes in the life from those four simple lines. The gospel story is beautiful. My formation, my transformation, and lastly, we come to my translation. What is that translation? That translation is simply this. The day comes where we bid this earthly world goodbye, and we are welcomed into the heavenlies, where we are getting that glorified, that new body, that incorruptible body, we must all be there at some moment. I look back upon this year and think of the friends at whose funerals I have spoken. Friends who loved us, 
who did so much for us, who have gone on to be with the Lord. And I know many in their younger years, my colleague Michael Ramsden's father-in-law, from diagnosis to death was a few days in the month of December, very suddenly diagnosed with a certain form of cancer, and within a few days was gone. And so Christmas begins to look back at one empty chair, but we realize that the translation comes, and it's a moment that we do not know of, but it will come. My good friend Paul Valentine, who preached in Stowe, Ohio, was speaking at his at a funeral that I was attending, and he tells the story of his father, who had passed away some time before. He said, I remember being in the ambulance and driving to the hospital, and his father leaned over and said, Paul, I recognize where we are. We're right by the bank, aren't we? And he said, yes, Dad. He said, you know, I have something in there. I have some accounts in there. Paul, I want to tell you something. All of a sudden, it doesn't mean very much. Take it, use it for yourself and the grandkids. But it doesn't mean very much anymore. I've never forgotten that. You can be on your way to your own death and go past all the institutions that you trust in. And you say, it doesn't mean very much anymore. So what abides forever? It is that relationship that God has promised you, the relationship that he wants to give you. And that's why Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O grave? is your sting. C.S. Lewis says this, most of man's psychological makeup is probably due to his body. When his body dies, all that will fall off him and the real central man, the thing that chose, that made the best or the worst out of this material will stand naked. All sorts of nice things which we thought were our own but which were really due to a good digestion will fall off for some of us. All sorts of nasty things which were due to complexes or bad health will fall off others. We shall then for the first time see everyone as he really was and there will be surprises. (laughs) And there will be surprises as we see each other as we really are. I want to tell you a couple of stories as I close and stick to my, just go up a minute or two over my time. Nick Charles was the first sports broadcaster the CNN ever hired. I remember seeing him come to the Lord some years later. He was a playboy by his own admission. Beautiful mop of hair, handsome guy. All the women fancifully imagined them having a nice evening with Nick Charles. Handsome fellow, and he knew it and used it. All of a sudden, you know, he said he needed to settle down and got married and I officiated at his wedding, married to a beautiful girl, Corey. They had a lovely baby. Long story. A few years ago, he contacted me. He said, Ravi, I'm in trouble. I need to see you. I thought, what's happened? So I arrived at a restaurant and I looked and looked for him and he put his hand up. He said, Ravi. I said, Nick? The hair was all gone. The face was sunken. He had been diagnosed with cancer and he was dying. Not that far advanced in years. I said, Nick, when did all this happen? He said, man, it's been a miserable journey. I've got a little girl now. And that's all I can think about. He moved over to New Mexico and Santa Fe. And a few days before he died, he said, can I see you? I said, Nick, I'm about to make a trip, but I'll come. So Margie and I went to see him and Corey. He was completely worn down to bone and skin. And he said, sit down here on my bed, please. So I sat down with him. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, Ravi, the world will mock what I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to tell it to you. So a few days ago, I was lying with my little girl beside me and my wife, Corey, and I was in such pain. I said, God, I've had enough. I've had enough. 
I don't want to say goodbye to my family, but it's time for me to go. Take me home. He said, Ravi, I want to tell you something. I promise you this happened. A light shone in the corner of my room and a figure that I could imagine only to be Christ. He walked over towards me, sat exactly where you're sitting, took me by the hand and said, Nick, I'm going to call you home, but not tonight. Just hang in there. He said, Ravi, it happened. put my hand on his forehead and prayed for him. And I said, Nick, all I can say to you is this. God will always meet you in the way you need him to meet you, especially when you are totally helpless. And I'll take your story at face value. A few days later, I was in Singapore when Nick passed away. And the CNN producer phoned me and he said, can I talk to you? He said, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, Nick Charles. You knew him? I said, yeah. He said, man, I love the guy. I said, we're doing a story on him on CNN. He said, but this story about Jesus coming into his room. He said, what do you make of it? I said, what do you think? I said, what do you know of Nick? He said, he was for real. I said, why don't you take his story as that which God knew Nick needed? and gave it to him when he was at his most helpless state. He said, man, I can't get that story out of my mind. What I say to you is this, God will give us enough hints along the way, as he did my father-in-law, minutes before he died. He looked up to the ceiling, he hadn't spoken for days, and he looked up to the ceiling and said, amazing, that's just amazing. And then he looked at his wife of 60 some years and said, Jean, I love you. And he was gone. Handel's Messiah was playing in the background. I believe it is Wordsworth who wrote this. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell? She answered, seven are we. Two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother. And in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. How many are you then, said I, if two are already in heaven? The little maiden did reply, O oh, master, we are seven. Death doesn't change the reality. I was 10 years old when my grandmother died, and I'll close with this. All I remember about that, actually nine, I was nine, all I remember about the funeral was a hymn they sang, Abide With Me. Fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. One of those verses says, Swift to its close, ebbs out life's little day, earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away, change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. The passing and the abiding, our formation, our transformation, our consummation, three of the greatest changes that God brings into your life May you know him so that you will eternally dwell in his presence for his word abides forever and the scriptures cannot be broken. He has promised to prepare a place for you and me. If it were not so, he would have told us. Enter this year knowing that swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim. Its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changes not, abide with me. May God richly bless you.